now we want to focus a bit more and talk with you about what's happening with the consumer as we always look at what is the biggest, I mean, essentially the consumer is the biggest driver to GDP. So it's worth um, looking at. And this always depresses me, obviously, because I'm in, um, I, I live in Long Island and you can see just how bad Long Island is in comparison to this. So the, um, the tax bureau, the Bureau of Economic Analysis puts this out every year and it's looking at $100 in the US. So if you have $100 US, how far will that get you in your location? So typically the average is anywhere, you know, I don't know, $105 to $110. So you'll get a little bit extra premium for that money. But then if you look at the coastal sides, obviously you get a lot less. So if you, you know, just for Long Island here, um, I'm actually losing money. So for every $100, I have about $80 worth of spending capacity. If you look at uh, California, it's something closer to 75 to 80. And again, this is that coastal side. So when we start looking at, and I don't know if you've seen the Wall Street Journal articles or Financial Times articles talking about the impacts of uh, a potential Biden victory to the your tax bill, it would clearly go up. So the idea is that you would actually be paying a, a closer to 60%, maybe a little over 60%. That's including state, uh, you know, state uh, property tax, you know, sales tax all in. And you can see the pain in which the coastal sides you know, essentially experience. I mean, most of the places, if you look at the Midwest, you know, the South is kind of where you get some of the most bang for your buck. And again, it just comes down to, well, if I, if I got the stimulus, how far does it go? And I think that's, that's really where I want to go with this chart is how far does stimulus really take you in terms of spending? Where if you consider a lot of the, um, you know, poorer individuals that may be li living in the urban settings, in the urban areas, you can just see that the, the pain is real. Even if you get an additional uh, additional money, how far does that actually bring you? You know, what how, how far does that carry you? And you can see just kind of where that pain really resides over the, um, over the last year. And sadly, it's depressing because New York is always at the bottom of that, uh, of that barrel. Now, as we talked about before, you can see the Philly uh, Business Outlook survey. And again, it's always important to appreciate survey versus actual data points. And But the surveys are, are a good kind of leading indicator as to what's going to happen going forward, what's potential. And here you can see the Philly uh, index surprise to the upside. It printed a 32.3. And it was, it was a pretty good beat across the board. It was across manufacturing, the ability to hire. So that's a positive in terms of some of those job indicators. You know, but at the same time, the issue was Michigan sentiment was either uh, flat, you know, it met estimates or was slightly below. And the issue was just how are people perceiving where, yeah, the surveys on the project manager level at the industrial level, you know, are looking better, but we're seeing a, a bigger issue in terms of some of those headwinds when we're looking at how does the consumer view the going forward. And this is really being impacted by no stimulus. Uh, job prospects continuing to fall to fall sideways, and is again that's just keeping that consumer cautious, which is why we continue to see or believe that the Q4 m numbers will will be a problem as we uh, as we go through the remainder of the year. And this is an interesting br backdrop in terms of you know kind of leading off of well, what is the consumer thinking? And if you look at what is early March versus late September. Now, the financial situation has been fairly stable in terms of what people thought their financial situation was going to be locally, but the issues on the, the overall uh, economic conditions in your region or country is starting to, it, it, was, it was bad, it's gotten a little bit better. The question is going to be what is happening overall and go and, and kind of heading into the, that direction because this doesn't actually pick up where things are getting better or, or worse in terms of COVID. So the financial situation has gotten slightly worse in terms of what people are, are assuming in terms of, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, slightly better, but the way they're viewing the overall economy of the country, of, of the economy, of the country has gotten much worse. And this doesn't even include the increase in COVID cases. So again, the concern overall continues to increase in terms of, well, do I need to save more because the economy is not doing well? Do I need to? And again, this comes to just adjusting overall consumption patterns on a global level as people get more and more concerned about not only the economic conditions in their region, but uh, region of the country, but also the country as a whole. 
And that's why when we look at, okay, well, let's take this to the U.S. What is happening in the U.S.? And we've talked about, you know, how people are scaling back work and you continue to see those reduced hours that are continuing across the board. And when women continue to take the bigger uh, share of that, and this is another another problem, not just because it's it's more weighted towards women, but the other issue is many of these households are used to two income homes. And now with either the, the mother or father or both pairing back, you're seeing those impacts in terms of the total consumption levels, which again, just comes to how do we get or, or kind of bridge to the next gap and really get things going. And that's, again, coming full circle back to those issues in terms of actual spending, consumer movements, you know, the, the jobs that will remain, you know, problematic. And then when we look at some of the, the U.S. credit and debit cards, you know, again, getting into, well, retail sales were good, but what does that mean? You know, here you can see kind of what is happening when we look at the overall retail, uh, you know, total credit card spending. So JP Morgan has their credit card uh, credit card usage down about 5.8%. And you can see, you know, what is adjusting, what what isn't. You, you, we've seen occasional uh, occasions and gifts coming down pretty hard. Apparel and accessories, again, had that nice little bump as we went into uh, the back to school. Department stores relatively flat. The bigger thing, it remains obviously food and beverage. Home and sporting goods have seen those increases because sporting goods just consider what, what are you doing when you want to be outside? Well, what it, where are you going to buy stuff to do outside sporting goods spots? So again, those are things that are, shouldn't be surprising overall. But again, the 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 conversion it, uh, we think is going to continue, you know, to that downside, especially as we start looking at what is happening with the manufacturing output versus surveys. Now, this is why I always like to talk about where surveys are good to show trend. So the idea is that the the slope is going to be aggressive. You're going to see a big bounce. But it doesn't mean that the manufacturing production or the actual numbers will meet exactly where it is because you may feel better versus what the actual data is showing you. And that's why where you, you know, here we, we saw a big spike in ISM manufacturing production index in terms of just what the surveys were saying, but manufacturing product production fell short. Now it's it's only supposed to kind of give you an indication of where things are going. Now what does this mean? I believe that you're going to get a conversion of, of, of the two, where now you're going to start to see some of the surveys get a little bit worse, while some of the manufacturing output gets a little bit better. And you're going to see kind of that meeting in, in the middle. And that's going to be those, those uh, issues where you're going to get the uh, ISM, PMI, get closer to 50, where it'll be expansion, but not the same level of expansion. But we, are, we will see some of that manufacturing production get a little bit better especially as we go through the end of the year. Again, not not back to pre-COVID levels, but again, just kind of getting uh, and marrying in the middle. Now, that's just looking at it from the manufacturing side, but let's look at it from the actual purchasing side. So when we look at U.S. retail, as uh, obviously we, we had a great um, move to the upside, and, and, uh, and you know, we saw it on the, on, the, on the line chart, but let's look at it on a bar chart. Because clothing, accessories continued, sporting goods, hobbies continue, uh, motor vehicle and dealer. Again, if you think about what is happening, people are buying used cars. They're you know maybe buying new cars and they're buying stuff for those cars and the dealers overall. People need something to do while they're home and they might need to do something with their kids. So again, those are those things that we're seeing at the top side. Electronics and appliance stores, again, coming to durable goods. If you made that purchase right out of the gate, how many times are you going to keep making that purchase? So those are some of the slow the things that will remain a little bit slower. Core retail, again, is going to remain fairly strong just given if we think about uh, food, given what people are doing. But what is actually happening at some of these areas? Because some of the prices continue to get elevated, specifically in the used car world, and what is happening when you think about kind of the skew to the upside. So when we take this information and now look at it in terms of U.S. retail sales versus indicators that should be going up at the same time. So if we're looking at this, again, coming back to the survey versus the data points, those indicators are showing something that that essentially, why are we here? Like we're not, we're, we're seeing some of these problems to the downside where retail sales have surged to the upside. And, and again, it's going to be a marriage of the two where 
retail sales will start to fall, but those indicators will start to come up and you're going to start to see those marry a bit. Now, things could change. We could get a big surge in terms of stimulus. It's unlikely. You know, JP Morgan, again, tracker of credit and uh, debit card transactions, spending was down 5.7% compared to a year ago through October 12th. So maybe you had a big spike in September, then things come down in October. You know, it's interesting to see the University of Michigan uh, Consumer Sentiment Survey also uh, so that auto buying plans plunged to a nine year low. So you had a surge in, in, in buying on the auto side, which September retail sales may have been the final kind of stimulus push. And now we're starting to see that come off in, Octo- uh, in October. Now, what, the, you know, the biggest stimulus report, so the other 60% of spending um, was cutbacks in education. So if we think about where people save money, so 60% of the spending pie was education, health, Domestic services, travel, and recreation of all sorts have freed up about $700 billion from February. So now you take the, the backdrop where that's almost two years worth of retail sales in just what you've saved. So you've saved about $700 billion in just stuff that you either can't buy, don't want to buy, or, you know, and by can't buy means that you just, that they, you don't have the option to go to the stadium or, or whatnot. Or you you don't want, you're trying to cut back and you're trying to save. So what's the easiest thing? No, don't go to the Giants game. Don't go to the movies. You know, things like that becomes a little bit easier. And unfortunately, if you watch the Giants, you would be you would not be going to the Giants game for other reasons outside of COVID. Just it's painful to watch. But that's besides the point. So when we look at kind of what's happening here, that could be some of that divergence, which is going to, to, to merge and, and connect. And then when we look at just kind of the supply uh, issue, so if we look at U.S. capacity utilization, so if you look at the utilization of industrial output, you know, here's kind of where we're at that bottom, where we, we came off the bottom pretty hard and now we're here. And the question is, is are prices being pushed higher because we still have shortages? Now, in the report that comes out on Friday, we, we do a big backdrop in terms of where do we see some of these uh, retail um, you know, inventories versus sales and what those ratios look like. But again, we're seeing some of these price increases, which just means that people may be buying m- not so much more stuff. It's just the value or the cost of them has gone up, which again is going to skew those retail sales. And if we think about, you know, as we talked about that car, per, uh, you know, what is happening with the U.S. car market? And we see uh, used cars are at 12-year highs, surging to the upside. And it's really because car production has been so low for, you know, we had that obviously bump in after, um, you know, cash for, for clunkers and all that, uh, you know, fun stuff. But now as we as we came into, you know, that peak of 2015 and down into 2020, you still can't order a 2021. There's still backlogs across the system. So, Again, the shortage is just driving prices where you may get less deals at the at the um, at the lot. There might be an issue in terms of where can you get some of this backdrop. And again, these are issues overall in terms of what could be driving some of these this rise in retail sales instead of just actual volume. Just the overall cost has been elevated, and that's when we start to look into that again U.S. industrial breakdown where you're seeing those those rollovers again the industrial. Uh, growth is back negative in terms of just that production level, industrial produ- and that's month over month change. And then if you look at industrial production, you know we still are well off of where we were previously, and we're starting to kind of roll over. And it's just a mixture of you know what are people want in inventory, what is the demand at the consumer level, and maybe there's just this concern in terms of uh, can I get the the necessary equipment or raw materials to make the final product. You know, th- this is where we're starting to see some of this bifurcation, or as people have been calling it, the K-shaped recovery of, you know, some things are doing really well, some things are doing really poorly, and then you kind of net out to you know, blah. And that's why we think that there's kind of this, this things are starting to roll a little bit. You know, COVID cases aren't helping. You know, some of the slowdown on a global level isn't helping, which is why we think there's going to be an additional pr- additional pressure as we go through Q4, where Q3 will most likely surprise to the upside on GDP. And we think Q4 is going to continue to be, uh, going to continue to see pressure. And you're actually going to see uh, re- um, 
rewrites or reductions in Q4 estimates as we go through the remainder of the year. And some of this, you know, not only COVID cases, but slowdowns in manufacturing and industrial start to pick up and start to show in the numbers really impacting some of that data. Mm-hmm. 